guys, welcome to another chemical engineering tutorial brought to you by the ChemEng student. In this lesson, I'm going to take you through my PhD journey in chemical engineering thus far. And this is predicated on several different people asking what my experience was in undertaking a PhD. And it follows from one of our previous videos on covering what actually is a PhD. So this one's more in detail about myself, my research, and if you're interested in it, then a collaboration um, is highly welcomed. Or if you have any questions um, that you want to ask, please feel free uh, to get in touch or comment your questions in the video as well. So first and foremost, what is my PhD about? So within, it's basically within the general field of chemical engineering, um, as is my other degrees, but I have a particular focus on the renewable sustainable biofuel production from microalgae. So in essence, we are looking at um, biomass for biofuel production. Now the fundamentals of my thesis is basically concerned with the application of what are called switchable hydrophilicity solvents also known as just switchable solvents or SHS. Now these aim to extract the lipids from several different strains of microalgae to be used for biofuel. So that's the fundamental of the paper. But the main aim and objective here is basically to determine the suitability of such an extraction process through an extensive DOE. Now DOE stands for Design of Experiment and for me my design of experiment is a two factorial design. So if you aren't really familiar with DOE, if that's something that you are interested in and would like to learn more about then let me know in the comment section um, and we can potentially look at creating some content around DOE and how you can integrate that to create your own experimental methodology. Now, in terms of the timeline for me, my, because basically what happens is, and it's usually the case for majority of PhDs, is your initial proposal will never go to plan. So be prepared to deviate consistently as you progress through. Because ultimately what you will do, and this is, Again, it's very dependent on what your PhD is in, but certainly scientific engineering perspectives, your experimental methodology will change because things will fail. So you have to be objective and adaptive to the changes that are gonna come your way. But a general time frame for me was I prepared the research uh, proposal which I used to apply for the PhD and I then used that as the foundation for my literature review in which it took me approximately seven months to research as much of the literature as I possibly could. Within that, I, pr I think I got about 380 references um, I use Mendeley for that. If you want to know how to write a basically a first class thesis, um, then we actually have a free dissertation writing course. I'll put a link in the description to that. And that goes through everything that I did during my master's and PhD thesis writing. It's got lots of hints and tips and softwares and stuff that will really help um, make this journey a lot easier. But when I conducted the literature review, I basically had about 350, 360 references, um, which equated to about, I think it was maybe 30,000 words. So that took seven months. And what that gave me was the background and the knowledge that I needed to design and carry, so basically design the methodology that I was gonna implement and then carry out the experiments. Now, because I'm working with biological systems, we have to take into account the time that they grow and how long the extraction processes, the purification processes are actually gonna take. So 
for me, the actual design of the experiment, the pre-screening tests, and the actual experiment themselves took about two years from start to finish. And that's not me having processed any data, that's just the collection, the pre-screening, and so forth. Now, I then, during, so within this section, these kind of happen simultaneously, but um, they can, you can't have the transfer event without having collected some primary data. So this transfer event was basically, I sat down with my assessor um, who asked me a lot of questions. I gave a short presentation on what I've done, what I'm planning to do. And they basically work out, is the work novel enough to merit awarding a PhD or should it be downgraded to an MPhil? And thankfully the assessor um, really liked where we were going and I was kept on on the PhD program um, for the duration of the, the studies left. And then where I am currently sitting is that you need to write up and analyze the paper and then you ideally want to try and create several different individual publications that will form the backbone of your entire thesis. That gives it body, that gives it power for your final examination. So sometimes abbreviated to a viver or a PhD defense. The more peer-reviewed journals, you, uh, papers you have, the stronger your argument of you know what you're talking about. So that's the, that's the, the timeline thus far. And a lot of quite, people ask me all the time, you know, how much does a PhD cost? And we talk about the different costs associated for different types of students in different countries in our um, PhD fully explained video. I'll put a link in the description to that. Um, and you can check that one out if you want to know more just in a general sense about a PhD. But typically the annual cost for PhDs in the UK for home students is between three and six thousand. International students can pay anywhere between twenty and thirty five thousand a year. The cost of my PhD in my institution was at £4,575 per year for three years as a full-time student. Now granted this changed when I was halfway through as my extensive knowledge in chemical engineering, my almost 10 years of teaching experience as of um, the recording of this video, um, they basically offered me a full-time lecturer position teaching chemical engineering project management and mathematics. So after that, I had to convert from full-time to part-time so that I could spread my time between those two commitments. But for full-time study, it was £4,575. However, the associated costs as well with traveling and living expenses, for me, was somewhat in the region of around £12,500. And for those of you that aren't from Scotland, so my PhD and where I stay is in Scotland, I stay in the capital in Edinburgh and I travel um, through to the other side of the country in Glasgow. So it's the east and west um, and the central belt of Scotland. So I had to travel that every every few days um, for you know the PhD, going into the, the lab and stuff. So. Um, that's the associated travel and living expenses um, on top of that. So you could really say the annual cost of the PhD was around 17,000. But again, that's maybe slightly conservative. It could potentially be maybe 19,000 as well. And that's for a home student. So if you were an international student, you know, you need to add significant amount more um, because of the tuition fees as well. Now, for me, although the core of my PhD thesis topic is chemical engineering, what you will find is that your PhD, especially in the literature review, you'll start off very specific and then it will branch out. So my core topic is based on a combination of chemical engineering principles, 
So that's things like the, the design, the balances of processes in general that gave me the foundation for mass transfer principles, for separation processes and so forth. I then had the addition of mathematics, so I created kinetic studies um, to show the diffusion of oil through the solvent and into the water, so a full separation process, mathematically modelled to basically theoretical um, or theoretical size what is actually going on, so I needed extensive maths. There was then chemistry involved, a lot of chemistry because the solvents that we work with, um, one is called nn dimethyl cyclohexyl amine, abbreviated to DMCHA, and the other one is DIPEA. So these are very, very special solvents that allow their polarity to change. If you want a really detailed um, explanation as to what a switchable solvent actually is, because I could talk all day about switchable solvents, if that's something that you'd like to learn more about in its general sense, let me know in the comment section below and I'll certainly look at um, creating a video for switchable solvents. They are really, really interesting um, chemicals. But we needed, or I personally needed, a lot of chemistry um, to understand the mechanics behind the molecular interaction of the atoms, the molecules, the chemicals and so forth the analytical side as well. So we use things like gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, um, NMR, all those kind of things, UV, IR. So all of that encompasses chemistry. And then finally, there was elements of biology because we are working with biological material. We're working with living organisms. So I had to know the behavior of these microorganisms had to know how to perform genetic identification. So for microorganisms, you use what's called 18S rDNA genetic tests. Similar to a PCR test, whereby you basically analyze the, the DNA and compare it to a standard, and that will tell you what the, the species is. So you can see that although the core aim and objective is this, it, encompasses so many different things and I'm an expert in chemical well I say I'm an expert I'm not an expert but I'm not a mathematician I'm not a chemist I'm not a biologist I am a chemical engineer so my core knowledge is in chemical engineering so as I mentioned in other videos when you are pursuing PhDs you need to be open to collaboration you need to you know speak to the right people get the advice that you need so I need to speak to, I need to collaborate with mathematicians, chemists, biologists to get a better understanding of the entire picture. Now, without getting too technical, um, the core of the PhD, so if I deal with this part here, so the core of the, the thesis is basically I can break it down into several key elements and that is really important because while you have a question, that question will encompass so many other key points that must be addressed before the final question can actually be answered. So the very general question that I want to answer is, are switchable solvents a viable option for sustainable lipid extraction from eukaryotic microalgae? So all the key points I mentioned, the chemical engineering, the maths, the chemistry, the biology, they are all required for this single question. But to answer this question, I need to consider the following key elements and answer these independently and then bring them all together. And this is why it takes so long. So this is one of the microalgae strains that we uh, work with. This is called Botryococcus branii. And what this basically does is, you can see the cell here, and all this, um, what looks like liquid, is actually oil, and that's the oil that we extract and turn into combustible biofuel. So that's, that's an image of the algae that I personally work with. But in order for me to answer that fundamental question, these are just some of the things I have to address. 
A lot of these are done in the literature review and then others are answered during the experimental methodology. So things like what are switchable solvents? I have to know what they are. I need to understand how they work, why they work, what the limitations are and so forth. I then need to know what microalgae is in a very general sense, but then I need to fixate on eukaryotic microalgae. Then how do you actually get biofuel? Because there is a huge misconception that um, you know this material here is biofuel. This is what's called lipids. These are non-combustible. So we have to basically make them combustible through a process called transesterification or esterification or methylation. Um, they're all exactly the same thing. And they basically convert this um, oil into a combustible fuel. So I had to fully understand all these processes and that's where the chemical engineering comes into play. Now the question then was, well, I now know what switchable solvents and microalgae are. Are they, are switchable solvents biocompatible? So this is where the experimental part begins to answer these. Then what is the life cycle of switchable solvents? This is where it gets very, very technical in chemistry because we're looking deep at the compound itself. We're understanding what's actually taking place on a chemical level. And then how do you genetically identify microorganisms? I am by no means a biologist, so that's something that I had to go and learn and collaborate with biologists. And then how do you optimize the lipid extraction efficiencies? That's the chemical engineering coming back because it's up to do with the process. And then finally, is a repetitive extraction system attainable with switchable solvents? That's just some of the questions that I have to answer in order to create my final conclusion to the fundamental question. So you can see how a PhD would grow arms and legs really, really fast. You have an idea, but it will grow and navigate its way into so many other areas that you have to know. So that's why the literature review took so long. That's why it's taken such a long time because of all this information that I've had to gather, store, process and learn and then be able to communicate it to the wider audience, both people with a solid understanding so you can become very technical and to a more generalized audience. So that's the core part of my PhD. Now you do have additional elements and for me, while the research is the core part, now I have teaching commitments, um, you are required to take on additional tasks and responsibilities. And for me, these included, you know, attending conferences and seminars, some within the UK, others, you know, abroad. So when you do a PhD, you will get to travel to lots of different countries. Um, it's very, very cool. Um, I have to say it's really, really nice to, to visit um, other countries, to speak to like-minded people. It's very, very interesting. Then write peer-reviewed articles, journals, review papers, collaborate, all that kind of stuff. Teach and support the academic staff. So that doesn't necessarily mean you do what I did and become a full-time lecturer, but you may be asked to you know, help out here and there. Promote your work through uh, networking channels. So for example, um, I like to share my work with my students uh, through the ChemEng student, through you know my audience on social media, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff. So again, ResearchGate. So if that's something that you know, you'd like to follow my research or you'd like to learn more, I'll put links in the description to all my um, academic uh, portals and you can see more um, on the colleagues as well that I work with. And then finally, completing relevant CPD training. So CPD is just continuous personal development. So that's things like, you know, doing courses, attending webinars, attending seminars, or just, you know, working towards improving yourself. And that's one of the great things about our courses. You know, all our courses, we are a CPD registered company. So by enrolling on our courses, you too are contributing to your own CPD training. 
So again, it's highly, highly valuable that when you go for a job and your employer says that you work for, you know, on CPD for yourself, it's a huge tick in your favour. So the CPD should never be underestimated. And then finally, just so that you can get an idea of, you know, some of the papers, these are just some of my academic um, papers thus far, is I have um, journals or articles in algae research, so that's on the cultivation, the production of lipids, the extraction, the detection, um, science of the total environment, the role of microalgae in achieving sustainable development goals in a circular economy. That was a really great paper, huge collaboration with us in the United Kingdom. Uh, we had people in United Arab Emirates in Sharjah University. So um, we had ones in Egypt. Um, it, was, it was a really, really good um, collaboration. So again, that's, that's where you, know, you bring experts and academics from all across the world to produce really fantastic um, papers here. So again, if you're familiar with any of these names that pop up, put a like in the description, give them a shout out. Um, it's really good to see as many of us collaborating together um, as possible. And then just another couple here. This was actually my very first paper um, where I worked with a lot of press, um, really gave the university some pub, you know, publicity, working with the media. Um, I have some podcasts as well that if you're interested, I'll put a link in the description to them once they're released. Um, but this is my very first paper, which is very, very exciting once your, your first paper is actually publicised. Um, and then this is my most recent, uh, which was lipid extraction. This was for two microalgae species using the switchable solvent DMCHG. And just for some context and a shout out, um, my supervisor and also colleague, uh, Dr. Cristina Rodriguez, um, she is, you know, my supervisor for the PhD and um, a mentor in chemical engineering as well. So that's why, you know, you'll see her name on all of the papers that I currently publish as well. So again, a big shout out to Cristina Rodriguez. Uh, there as well. But my final thoughts thus far on the PhD is that the many people will say a PhD is a terrible experience or a waste of time, a waste of money and energy. And this I really couldn't disagree more because it really does depend on the motives for doing a PhD and whether or not you enjoy what you do. I as a lecturer, as a PhD, as an entrepreneur, there isn't a day where I don't enjoy getting up early in the morning and doing what I do. So if you embark on a PhD that you don't really like, then it will be a terrible experience by the end. It will be a waste of your time. But if it's something that you're genuinely interested in, you enjoy, you see the value, it will be a fantastic experience, a huge learning experience. Because for me, doing a PhD has allowed me to network and meet so many incredible people thus far, develop my knowledge academically, but allow that to integrate into business as well. And this is why our courses are so comprehensive, is that I'm using the continuous material, the, the things that I learn, and putting it into these courses. So, you know, it's it, that's why it, they're so comprehensive. And, you know, I, I could talk all day about the pros of a PhD, but I think um, I've pretty much covered everything that is of value but again if there's something that I've mentioned and you think I'd really like to know more about that then leave a comment um, and I'll certainly look at you know making some content surrounding that. So that is the end of this lesson. Thank you very much for staying with me um, to hear about my PhD journey. Um, if you like this video please consider liking and supporting the channel. It really helps us reach as many chemical engineering students as possible and it allows me to continue to make these videos as well. So thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing you in another video.